Good afternoon uh, to all you colleagues. We're pleased to have you join us uh, today uh, in the COP27 side event uh, on insurance and adaptation. Insurers at ri as risk managers and investors. Uh, we have seen uh, climate risks, climate impacts becoming greater. The past summer in particular has shown us once again that the climate crisis is already happening. Droughts, heat waves and floods have severely affected many regions in Europe and in the world. These natural disasters resulted in huge economic losses. The economic cost of climate change is constantly increasing. However, as we know, currently in the European Union, around 70% of these losses remains uninsured. This is a systemic problem that somehow needs to be tackled. And this is one of the reasons why the European Commission will be launching uh, the Climate Resilience Dialogue, which will strengthen the collective understanding between insurers, reinsurers, businesses, consumers and other stakeholders on narrowing the climate protection gap and helping our societies to adapt and build resilience. Let me now turn to introducing our speakers. Uh, firstly, we're very delighted to have Mr. Malvern Shirum, the Chief Underwriting Officer of African Risk Capacity. He has extensive international experience across insurance, underwriting, audit, finance and risk management in several countries. ARC Group is a specialized agency of the African Union established to help African governments improve their capacities to better plan and respond to extreme weather events and natural disasters, strengthening their capacities to deal uh, with systems and access rapid financing. Then we have Ms. Marie scholler Mendes who is an expert in sustainable finance at the European Insurance and Occupational Pensions Authority, EOPA. This is the European Union's financial regulatory institution that promotes the development of insurance and occupational pension sectors. And then we will also hear from Ms. Michaela Köller, Director General of uh, Insurance Europe, the European Insurance and Reinsurance Federation. Michaela has long-standing expertise on the topic. She has served as a member of various consumer and industry groups and advisory groups established by the European Commission. During the panel conversation and, and the subsequent chat, I would all, I st I also invite you to uh, post your questions in the general chat. We will collect the most interesting ones and our speakers will reply them at the end of the session. So let's get started. Uh, firstly, Michaela, I would invite you to share with us uh, the insurer's perspective on the role of insurers in managing climate related risks. Please go ahead, Michaela, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, Elena. Uh, first and foremost, of course, also um, for the organization of this um, panel on this very important topic. And I think you have in your introduction already highlighted what is at stake by referring to the situation that we have all experienced um, this summer. And clearly, if we needed any reminder, we only have to also look at um, the UN Climate Change October report um, that also very clearly said that there is currently no credible pathway to a 1.5 degree um, world and that more ambition is needed clearly. And what we are seeing um, that if we maintain current efforts, that this would result in a world more towards moving more towards a 2.5 degree scenario by 2100. Now, um, obviously, when we look at it from an insurance perspective, uh, climate change um, and then the adaptation to climate change and closing protection gaps uh, are not um, are really key for the world, but also very important for the insurance market. And, you know, I'm always um, fond of quoting one of our CEOs uh, uh, at this point uh, of the debate 
um, the uh, CEO of uh, Swiss Re uh, said, we are looking at these questions since the 70s. You know, this is when they raised the issue of climate change and drew already attention uh, to that. So there is clearly a, a role for the insurance sector um, in, uh, uh, you know, combating climate change and adapting to um, the world we are living in. And we have, we know simply that societies with stronger insurance penetration tend to recover better from natural catastrophes than those with a relatively low rate. And therefore, from our perspective, it is also very important um, to ensure that we address these protection gaps and that we also ensure that people can afford insurance also moving forward, despite the fact that we have more frequency and higher severity of events um, triggered by climate change. Now, when we look at uh, the role of insurance um, and what we can do um, for adaptation, I think first and foremost, we want to look, of course, at the role that the industry can do and play. Um, and when I look at how companies approach it, I think first and foremost, what we see is um, there is the warning function. You know, we, we want to alert um, the general public, um, authorities um, to the effects of climate change. We have been witnessing um, this, uh, I, as I said, for years, for decades. And um, combined with this raising awareness role, there is also the role um, to provide advice. Um, this is a very strong function, I think, of the insurance sector um, that um, we are, I think, able to provide given the long history that we have in, you know, monitoring these risks, assessing these risks and, and working with these risks. So very important first step, raising awareness. But then, of course, the second core function that the insurance sector uh, provides is uh, that we are providing cover. And then if an event happens, relief to people um, that uh, are taking out this insurance cover. And uh, we are uh, providing risk-based underwriting to cover um, these risks. So there is also a very important function in that we want to extend um, you know, the protection to the vulnerable parts of the society. Um, so this is what the industry per se can do. But I think um, what we are increasingly, um, um, we have an ambition to go beyond what we can do as an industry on our own. Uh, we are really very interested and indeed open also for joint initiatives. Um, so we are reaching out and we want to work together with public authorities, uh, either through public-private partnership, but also, you know, what you are now organizing, the Climate Resilience Dialogue is something that we find incredibly valuable because it will allow us yet again, you know, to come in, share expertise and exchange views. But uh, going back to this idea of public-private partnership, what we can offer from the insurance sector is, I think, robust data sharing on um, climate loss data, also sharing risk management, expertise, experience. We can, um, you know, in a public-private partnership, advise on prevention measures. And then in the end, I think we also need to recognize from the insurance sector's perspective that there is a role where insurers can only as far, you know, we can do our own bit, we can work with public authorities, but then there is also a role that public authorities need to play themselves. And here I'm speaking about, you know, um, basically meeting the responsibility in adapting land use planning, you know, maybe looking at uh, building codes, um, thinking about flood defenses. So these are all public, um, uh, public roles um, on which obviously we don't have a say, but where we can advise and where we hope to also you know, steer probably uh, or provide guidance so that this is happening. 
Um, one last point before I stop, uh, if I may, um, we are often asked, you know, can insurance also act as an investor? And, um, you know, when I look at the investment role of the insurance uh, sector, this is very clearly and strongly focused on mitigation. Um, and I think um, this is the result of our business model. Um, we have, of course, uh, both the need and the ability uh, to invest because we have assets with a long-term perspective. Um, and um, we are currently still, when we look at our investment in mitigation, we have a couple of barriers um, that need to be addressed. First, currently there is not enough assets, uh, suitable assets to invest in. So when you look around, um, the assets that we are finding are largely oversubscribed. Uh, the second point, and that is addressed by you in the commission, is um, also that we have a need for reliable, comparable ESG data, and this is on the way. And we are very happy that uh, this is happening. We are not always happy with the sequencing, where, but we are happy with the general direction of travel. And the last element that you in the commission are also having an influence on is obviously our regulatory framework with Solvency 2. Um, and if we get a better reflection of uh, our risk profile, then that could also enable us to have um, better um, investment capacity in the mitigation side. Now on adaptation, in contrast, it is much harder uh, for the insurance sector to um, really go in. Uh, why? Because we are, of course, investing um, the money that policyholders are um, uh, giving to us. And we have a duty vis-a-vis -vis our policyholders in terms of return on investment. Now, this duty we can fulfill when it comes to investing in mitigation pro projects like windmills, solar panels. It's much harder to get um, adaptation dividends because what we uh, tend to get when we, in, when we would invest in adaptation, and there are a few players who do it, but there, you know, you don't get direct cash flows. What you get is probably a better claim situation in the mid to long term. But this is not really what we can do, I, I would say, in a broad way from an insurance, insurance perspective business model. And maybe with these few introductory comments, I stop and um, let the other um, panelists come in. Thank you very much, Elena. Thank you so much, Michaela. And I think it's very useful to get your perspective, particularly on the points of, of uh, return on investment. It is, it is a business after all. And uh, there are things that we can do for, for the, in the interest of our shareholders. And then there are things that Kind of don't fall into that remit but it doesn't mean that those challenges are uh, irrelevant we, we do need to look at okay what are the models that could make that then uh, something that could be covered if not uh, by uh, private involvement only but is there ways of, of the regulator or the public sector to, to come in and, and contribute somehow uh, very interesting elements. Also, I liked particularly that the emphasis on data and and uh, 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 sharing of, of that type of robust data. Because in uh, many areas of work, what we don't measure, what we can't uh, you know understand, we also can't manage or control. So, good points there. Let me now then uh, turn to our second speaker. And. Uh, here, indeed, we bring the COP27 very close with the African perspective. Mr. Malvan Chirum, uh, may I un invite you to, to share some insights and your expertise uh, in working particularly with local governments in Africa and uh, what poses the greatest challenges but also the greatest opportunities in your work? Thank you very much, Elena. Uh, and also thanks to Michaela. Uh, fortunately, um, she's actually covered quite a lot of points, but what I'll just try and do is give an African context to the points. Um, the first thing just to say is that the protection gap uh, within the continent from climate-related disasters is actually estimated at 97%. Uh, this is a shocking figure, uh, which basically means that only 3% of the 
economic losses that are caused by climate related disasters are actually covered. Now, when you overlay that with the lack of trust in insurance, uh, low insurance penetration, and also just competing uh, needs from a fiscal perspective, it, you know, then it does paint a picture where there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. Uh, but fortunately, with all with COP27 and with with the other COPs, I think that you know there's now a, more of a spotlight on what we need to do to to really move the needle, if if, if I can use that term. Uh, so that's really the uh, you know the context. Um, the other the other uh, point just to make is that um, when you look at the continent. It is the continent that is most affected by the change in climate, yet it is the one that is least able to actually deal with the, with the increase in frequency and severity you know, of the natural disasters. Also, there's going to be a new peril which people rarely talk about, which is heat stress. You know, there's going to be parts of the continent that are actually not, uh, not inhabitable just because of the, you know, of the high temperatures. So there is that on one aspect. And then maybe just to sort of, so once I've painted that picture, then we look at wh why we were actually formed. We were formed because ministers of finance realized that we didn't need to look to view natural disasters as, as uh, shocks. You know, we, we generally know through data and models that the, you know, the frequency and severity of these, uh, you know, like droughts are fairly predictable, you know, um, so we don't need to have this, oh, there's a drought in, in Somalia, or there's a drought in, uh, in Zambia, and so forth. So that was really the, 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 the initial point that led to the, to the formation of this, you know, of, of African risk capacity. And uh, we are celebrating our 10-year anniversary. Uh, we have, we're almost at the point where we've managed to transfer $1 billion worth of coverage primarily for droughts, but also for tropical cyclone. And next year, we, we will be doing the same for flood as well. Um, but the, 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 you know, if you just, told, you know, if you look at the 97% that I spoke about, they still, the 1 billion is, is really uh, loose change in terms of what, you know, what needs to be done. So there are a number of issues that uh, we, you know, uh, that needs to be addressed, but clearly the, the opportunity to transform uh, the lives and levels of people who are exposed to natural disasters is huge. You know, it's, it's, it's huge. So that's really, for me, that what, you know, that is a single factor that, you know, that gives me energy. I don't worry about the, you know, the, the low penetration and the low uh, gap. You know, I just concern myself with, with opportunity. Um, and so the, and, and maybe some of the differences that we have between maybe more established uh, players or maybe more established regions. So with, within the continent, the disaster risk management is not really part and parcel of national law. Um, so that means that you know there are no established uh, established uh, institutions that deal with the disasters in most of the countries. There is no um, you know they, in, in in some cases there is no you know, financing tools that address risks, you know, like droughts, floods, and so forth. So what tends to happen is that then when uh, an event occurs, there's a scramble essentially to try and see what are the available finances, where else can come in to, to assist, you know, the, the, the affected government. And really what we are trying to do is to really change that, to change that narrative from a scramble to say we need to see uh, pre-arranged financing and a clear view of the country's and needs from a, you know needs and exposure from let's say drought, floods, and tropical cyclones, and that's where we really come in in terms of the, the you know the, the services that we provide. So we provide modeling uh, tools that enable a country to be able to you know to to quantify its exposure to to droughts uh, using historical data. But also using socioeconomic factors uh, such as you know exposure to drought and uh, available, you know the, the the reliance on the income from you know, from agriculture. If there's a drought and more than fifty percent of your population rely on agriculture as a source of income, clearly that, you know there are going to be issues. So really, at the at the core of our service, it's a public good. We don't actually charge for it. All, all a country has to do is to say, "I'm interested in working with with, with African as capacity." And then we deploy our various tools from a capacity building, uh, political engagement, 
to actually go into the country and and and, and assist them. If the country then says, okay, given all these tools, I'm now happy to to actually in, ensure or transfer part of my risk to you know to the risk pool, then we we help them. But you know, at the core of our service, it's there is no uh, it, it's not compulsory for any country to to say for us to say, well, for for you to get services access to our service, you have to participate in the risk pool. The two are separate, and we do that because clearly, you know, part of the issues we face are just uh, the country is not being aware of what risks they're, 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 they're actually exposed to. So that's really important. We feel that even if there are no financing tools available, a country going to some of the donor partners and saying, well, our exposure to drought is so much from our own resources, we only have 10% to cover that. Can you help us uh, crowd in the other 90%? That's too useful than going in for this scramble uh, approach that I mentioned. So that, that's sort of the, really the you know the, the key thing we want P to see peer arranged financing taking more of a center stage, you know as we move you know into 2023 uh, you know and beyond. We don't want to see this this scramble which really results in 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 the gains that have been made through development being being washed away. So in some of these countries, a significant drought can wipe away uh, 10 or 15 year worth of development and affects millions of people in terms of their, their lives and livelihoods. Um, in terms of um, in, in terms of the investment side, well, it, we are also you know, an insurance company, we also have a regulator. So similar to some of the comments that Michaela made, it's even though we, are, we participate in the principles for responsible investment and we are part of the net zero asset owners uh, license, there's still only a limit to how much we can really use our investment portfolio to really drive the sort of change that we want to see. And really it's because, you know, you know, as a single insurer, even though we are a risk pool, a sovereign risk pool, uh, that serves uh, very uh, vulnerable people, they, we, we, you know, our levers to really change the landscape are limited. Um, so we, although we, so we do try to integrate sustainability uh, through our investment portfolio by applying the, you know, the, the the ESG lens, but I, I suppose um, that you know there's very there are various interpretations of what ESG really is and what, how to you know to make sustainability uh, part and parcel of what we do. Um, of and and, and so we, we do try, but I still feel that this area still needs a, a lot more uh, development before we can really uh, start to feel uh, to feel that you know we are making the, you know. The most impact from our perspective we're really focusing on the services that we can provide from a risk management from a pooling perspective from the risk pool from uh the governments being able to arrange financing uh, so that they can uh you know pre-arrange you know pre-arrange finance so that they don't have to then uh in, you know wait before people engage in, in negative coping mechanisms whilst they try and uh, arrange uh, finance so these are the, the main thoughts, and just also to say that all the things that Michaela said in terms of the insurance apply, but the context is much worse. You know, I think she mentioned seventy uh, percent, and you know, I, I'm just talking about ninety-seven percent in terms of the protection gap. So with those, with that, I will pause here and uh, and hand it back to you, uh, Alina. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that perspective. And, and it is shocking indeed that it's only 3% in the African continent uh, that is covered by the insurance. Uh, and and uh, that really uh, highlights the exposure that uh, the continent as the most vulnerable and indeed least capacitated to deal with climate uh, consequences is facing. And I particularly liked you know, the way you approach your cooperation with the countries. Uh, because I think that that kind of country consciousness, awareness and, and ownership is going to be super important um, in uh, advancing the agenda uh, and also getting all the stakeholders involved. So, so many thanks for that, Malvern. Then let me turn uh, to our last, but certainly not the least, panelist, uh, Marie. Uh, it's great to have you uh, with us and, and to give us a little bit of an uh, institutional perspective from the authoritative uh, side of things uh, to add to these two uh, very inter interesting interventions from both Michaela and Malvern. 
Marie, over to you. Thank you very much for the introduction. I think there should be some time. Perfect. Thank you very much. So I'm very happy to be able to, to present at uh, this uh, COP27 side event because at the European Insurance and Occupational Pension Authority, uh, we want to address the protection gap. I think it is clear from the previous speaker, from the introduction, I mean, even in Europe, uh, there is a bit more than a quarter of losses which were insured in the past. And this shows that there is already a significant protection gap today. In addition, if you take climate change, uh, we will have increasing events, frequency, intensity, and this will just lead to further widen uh, the existing protection gap if no measures are taken. So how to address the protection gap? I mean, at EOPA, we are working on three different pillars. The first one is to understand. We need to know what are we talking about. And that's why we are looking at uh, modeling the risks and also to get access to the right data. The second pillar, which is really the central pillar uh, on addressing the protection gap, is that you need to mitigate the risk. Actually, you need to reduce the causes of climate change and adapting to it. And this is a must. Without that, I don't think we can address the insurance protection gap even in Europe. The third pillar is, of course, I mean, we are looking at the insurance protection gap. So it's also about covering your risk. There, we don't need 100% insurance um, penetration, but we need to have optimal insurance coverages. And for some risk, also thinking of climate change, we need to also uh, think more of more of a public-private partnership because I think uh, these are also key element uh, to address the protection gap. So the next slide, please. So let's start with the first pillar, uh, which is looking at understanding the protection gap. So at EOPA, we have developed a dashboard uh, to monitor the insurance protection gap uh, in, the, in Europe. So we have developed this dashboard for 30 European countries. So we, you will have a view for each uh, of the 30 country and for five different Paris. So we are looking at earthquake, windstorm, coastal flood, wildfire and pluvial and fluvial flood. So all this for this dashboard and we have a current view of the protection gap. So here we are using a modeling approach. So we are using natural catastrophe models to estimate the risk in each country for windstorm, wildfire, and so on. And we are looking at what is uh, the estimated protection gap to derive a score for the current protection gap. We also have a view of the past. So we are looking at the historical loss data, economic and insured loss data to also be able to derive a score for uh, the historical protection gap. This can complement a bit also the, the current view. And the third view that we have is a country insurance scheme view. And there, because if you look at the different uh, European countries, how natural catastrophe is insured is very diverse. I mean, in some countries you have public private partnerships. In some countries, it's only the private market. So it's extremely diverse. And this we also wanted to be able to provide to the user complementary information. We also provide information about uh, the affordability, uh, the uptake of uh, insurance coverage and so on, just all these different parameters that can better explain uh, the situation, the insurance protection gap in each of the covered countries. And this dashboard is going to be published uh, by in December this year on EOPA's website. And I mentioned this aim of the dashboard is to monitor the protection gap. Of course, we want to raise awareness about the insurance protection gap for any stakeholder. We want to promote a science-based approach to be able to identify regions which are at risk. And also what is very important to mention is we want to trigger discussions. I mean, this dashboard is using okay input data, some methodology, but the main point is really about triggering discussions to discuss prevention measures, solution, how to address the protection gap. And another action is also that there could be potential synergies you know, between different national policies to address the protection gap across borders because perils, they don't stop at borders at a European level. So that's uh, the main goal of this dashboard. And we will update this dashboard regularly in the future. One key uh, issue that we, of course, uh, when developing this dashboard that uh, came across to us is 
something was mentioned before is the availability of data. I mean, getting the right data to be able to create uh, such a dashboard. And this leads me to my uh, second slide, please. I mean, accessibility of model and data to understand the protection gap is key. And that's why at EOPA, one of our key strategic area in sustainable finance is also uh, to promote the use of open source model and uh, data. I mean, data models crucial to um, have climate risk assessment for the industry, uh, for the supervisory committee, but for the public sector in uh, general. At EOPA, we need to do a lot of natural catastrophe risk assessment. We need it for capital uh, requirement calibration. We need it for the dashboard I just showed you on the previous slide. Uh, we need it for financial stability analysis or supervisory risk analysis and so on. In addition, uh, we also recently published an opinion to include climate change uh, scenarios uh, in the interest um, on risk and solvency assessment in their author. And also there, a key issue that was depicted is, well, actually, uh, which tools and data are available to be able to run uh, such uh, climate change scenarios. This is far from being straightforward to do. And we see development. We see more and more tools, data available, they are developed, but it's still not easy to get access to the right tool and the data to be able to do uh, while you are, you, are, you are interested. So for example, you might have some tools, they are available open source, but then it's not very user-friendly. On the other hand, you have some tools that are maybe user-friendly, but then extremely expensive. And that's why at EOPA, we have decided to test the use of an open source uh, catastrophe model called Climada, which is developed by a uh, university, uh, the ETH Zurich. And by using this open source tool, what we realized, well, it's not user friendly at all. You really need to dig in in the code and to run the analysis and you need to be an expert in coding, which not everyone is who actually wants to run that type of analysis. So we decided at EOPA to uh, create a graphical user interface to facilitate uh, the use of uh, this um, catastrophe model so that anybody could actually uh, run an analysis with their own portfolio if they are uh, interested in. Uh, next year in Q2, uh, we will have an event to actually uh, release this uh, graphical user interface open source so that anybody could download it and uh, try to run their own uh, cut risk analysis. In the long term, we aim to support the modeling of uh, climate change risks, but not only setting the path to develop more models, promote the use of open source models, but also by positioning ourselves as a relevant open source data hub, providing uh, relevant data, such as, for example, also uh, insured loss data. So moving to the next slide, please. Now let's move on to the second pillar. And this is really uh, the, the central pillar because we are here looking at the insurance protection gap. So we can think, okay, you want to address the protection gap, insurance protection gap, you can increase insurance penetration. But it goes without saying that the best solution is to reduce the cause of climate change and also adapt to its consequences. Let me give you an example. I mean, we are here, for example, talking about non-life uh, insurance product, uh, property insurance. These are typically short-term contracts, 12 months, and which means that they can also reprice uh, annually. So if the risk is now increasing, if the premium is risk-based, the premium can also reflect now uh, the increases of the risk. But at some point, this might lead to uh, the insurance product to become unaffordable. And then, of course, it will disincentivize people to take uh, insurance coverages and then just widen further uh, the protection gap. So that's why it's extremely key to think about prevention measures, building vulnerability, we mentioned building codes and so on, to also think about the localization of the exposure and to have optimized insurance coverages. And these are key elements of a resilient society. And reinsurers, as society's risk managers, they can contribute to reduce climate change risks. And some insurers, we heard, uh, they're already doing so. They provide um, advices on adaptation measures to policyholders, and these are extremely important measures. And in our context of um, concept of impact underwriting, we actually aim to capture uh, this option for implementing climate change adaptation and or mitigation 
through pricing and underwriting. And in that regard, we are currently working also on a report um, on the integration of climate change adaptation measure in non-life insurance product. And we have two main aims. The first one is to actually um, collect underwriting practices. So better understand how adaptation measures are, um, are captured in non-life insurance product to promote this uh, further and to also have good underwriting practices. The second aspect of this work is also to assess how adaptation measures, they can be better reflected in the capital requirement for non-life underwriting risk under solvency too, because the capital requirement is, is risk-based. So now if you take prevention measures, uh, your risk is lowered. So this would also need to be uh, reflected in uh, the capital requirement. So these are projects that we are currently working on. So moving to the next slide, please. And now uh, let's go to the last slide. So this is about the third pillar to uh, cover the risk. And here at EOPA, we are, for example, also looking at uh, demand side issues. Uh, and consumer, they might tend to sometimes underestimate the risk. And therefore, they will not necessarily find the benefit of insurance cover. I mean, you have a, to pay for a premium for something that will happen in the future. Maybe it's not so attractive. So that's why it's extremely important to raise awareness about the risk that the consumer they will face. In addition, sometimes it's also not always straightforward to understand your con insurance contract. Um, and then there might be also some expectation gaps that are arising. And these expectation gaps, they will be then detrimental to consumer and could also impact their trust in the insurance sector. In this regard, EOPA has issued a supervisory statement to promote contract uh, simplicity. So to conclude uh, for this presentation, Climate change is a growing risk for the insurance sector, but it also creates a lot of opportunities for insurers, supervisors to be part of the solution to address climate change risks. With data, innovation, incentives, it's possible to help people and businesses to prepare for future risk. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks so much, Marie. Uh, super fascinating and, and very interested to hear more about your tools, uh, the dashboard and, and uh, also the kind of uh, uh, awareness raising that you are engaged in. Uh, as you said in the very beginning, the protection gap will only widen uh, as the climate impacts become every, ever more omnipresent and, and uh, closer to, to the citizen and, and the industry and the businesses. So. Uh, there is definitely a lot of ground to cover. Now, we come to the interactive part of our session, uh, and I would like to start by asking you all to reflect uh, uh, a little bit on what you have seen happen in the past 10 years in terms of the evolution of the sector. Uh, how has the, the climate science, the availability, the general debate, how has that been reflected in the sector and, and uh, has that contributed to an increased willingness uh, to seek uh, approaches and insurance coverage specifically related uh, to climate change. Um, and uh, then in the same go, uh, if you allow, it would be good to hear a little bit from you in response to what you have heard, maybe particularly from Marie, as, as many of the, the lessons that uh, both Michaela and uh, uh, we had uh, uh, Malvern bring across seem still quite similar, although they are from entirely different contexts. Uh, Michaela, you have had the opportunity to be quiet the longest. So I would last ask you to, to once again kick off uh, with uh, a bit of reflection. Thank you. You need to just unmute yourself, please. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I thought I had unmuted myself. Um, I th well, first, thank you very much to both Malvern and Maria. It, it was very interesting. And I think the first conclusion we can draw is, you know, we all come to the same conclusions. We look at it, obviously, in the context of our own environment. Um, uh, 
if I can maybe uh, say a few words also on the African situation, um, I'm also very active in the context of, um, you know, a global debate uh, because Insurance Europe is also a member of CHIFIA, the Global Federation of Insurance Associations. And as such, um, when you look at CHIFIA, we are currently working on, um, for the first time, I must say, um, on a study that looks at um, protection gaps on a global level. And one of the key areas we are looking at is indeed also um, the gap uh, resulting from the climate change uh, challenge. And in that respect, of course, the idea was um, to look not just as we are now uh, traditionally um, uh, focusing on Europe, not just on Europe, but also uh, compare and contrast what is going on in, in different regions of the world. And I think my first statement will be, we all have experienced very similar challenges as we could see also from Malvan today, but then to find solutions, we need to look at each, our, at each of our regions very clearly and find the regional recipes to address um, the challenges. Now we can come up with general recommendations. And in that respect, I think what IOPA is doing is very helpful. When I look at the European dashboard, this can, this can provide you know, guiding principles but it will only be effective when we complement it. And that is certainly in Europe the case with also, you know, the national data analysis. Now, for example, when I look at initiatives at European level, we have members that cooperate very closely at national or sometimes even at regional level with their governments, with the communes in, in sharing, for example, um, uh, um, claims data and, um, I, I, I myself, I'm, I'm from Germany, I'm um, also frequently in Austria, and when I see how the collaboration works in these two countries, and I experience it also uh, personally, when, for example, I recently had a project with a house, I went to a national um, um, uh, developed, jointly developed website between uh, the Austrian industry and the government where they are assessing ongoing natural hazard risks. And you can essentially put in the address of your project and it gives you the exposure to all um, the challenges. So it goes to natural, natural climate related challenges. So it goes to a level of detail that I guess IOPA couldn't you know, demonstrate. But the, the complementing factors, that is what ultimately will bring uh, the results. Um, and in that respect, I think it is very important that we push this ongoing dialogue, um, discussion, exchange, and the continuous improvement. Maybe also one word on, on data. Um, there is, uh, of course, uh, as I said already uh, now, a very strong um, interest by the insurance sector to also engage on the basis of the data that the insurance sector has uh, collected over the years um, and um, share that with relevant organizations. What we generally see is that what is helpful is to have a very good framework for sharing these data, for to know what, what is the context, how are we going about it, what is, um, you know, uh, is there also a certain level of, of reciprocity in, in terms of the end goal? So um, also here, there is really um, the, the readiness, the preparedness from the sector, and it's very good to see that, you know, the thinking when we look at what um, Malvan said and also what Marie provides as an overall um, structure is going very much in the same direction. Maybe I stop here. Thanks very much, Michaela. Then uh, I turn to Malvan uh, for, for some reflections on the applicability and transferability of uh, lessons, best practices and how this has evolved over time. Has there been uh, increasing cooperation between yourselves and, and uh, you know, representatives of the same sector uh, across the different continents? And uh, is there lessons that can be captured in the work? Malva, over to you. 
Thanks, Elena. Uh, I think firstly, before I answer that question, I just think that it's useful just to state that, you know, it's incredibly, um, it's, it's just so striking that the challenges that we face as an industry are common. What's different is just the context. So what that means for me is that there's opportunities for cross-learning from various, uh, and actually I'll be reaching out to all the participants of this panel because there's so many things that I'd actually like to discuss on a bilateral basis. And I was actually, so I think that's really important. And then I'll just go back to the first question before I go into detail. So I think there's, there, there can always be more that, you know, that can be done. I think that's, you know, that, there's no question about it. Uh, you know, the availability of reinsurance, for instance, for of African droughts is, you know, is multiplied, uh, you know, in, in, in recent years, uh, partly because, you know, in terms of the natural cats, most of the major or the global reinsurers uh, don't have, uh, you know, any African, any exposure to African uh, natural cats. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a diversifier. Uh, but also, there's also a growing number of, of reinsurers who are also willing to to contribute, you know, in terms of the ESG to say, well, actually, we need to be seen to be doing something and providing reinsurance, even though it's on commercial terms, it's still, it's still useful. So I think there's generally been a, there's a, you know, there's more availability of tools that are uh, investing in the, in the, in developing the markets uh, and also, you know, in, in, in contributing to models and data. And just maybe a quick word on models and data. If you look at the number of models that service the North American uh, Atlantic hurricane, you know, um, uh, sort of uh, basin, and you look at the models that serve the African continent, you know, it's chalk and cheese. You know, there's very few models. So one of the things that I'd, I'd like to see is the industry looking at this more from a humanitarian perspective as opposed to, to, to an economic model that says, well, okay, you know, how much, you know, how much can I sell my services? You know, if there's an RMS. How much can we, you know, uh, you know, how much, how many, how much fees can we generate? So I think that, you know, that's that's one of the things. So I think this movement has been in the right direction, but given the challenges that we face, you know, the, you know, the, the, it, there's a lot more to do. And then if I just look at the tools that uh, um, uh, that Marie spoke about, you know, I was when I, you know, I really like the dashboard. Uh, the data that informs that may be a challenge, but you know the thing is the principle still holds. We don't need the same level of data to you know or the same same granularity to inform the the you know the the proper recording of the of the protection gap on the continent. So you know I think they, there's a lot of information that she shared that that can be transferred, and that can also just as she mentioned, just, you know, really uh, initiate the, the discussion. In some cases, just having the discussion is actually making progress because some of the things that then get discussed have not been discussed before. So now we, and we get able to elevate the platform in terms of, okay, it's being discussed at this level, but now with COP20, you know, with COP and with, with climate change being such a, you know, a, a, an important aspect uh, in terms of the global agenda, we're able to quickly elevate. So I really like the tools that Mary has, and I will be reaching out to see how we can also uh, use them and learn from them. Um, and then obviously in terms of the, you know, uh, Michaela represents, you know, quite a, a significant number of, of insurers and, and, and reinsurers. So there's clearly uh, things that we can learn from there, but there's also uh, some advocacy that, you know, that can take place. So, you know, the, there's just uh, platforms that can be created just by having, you know, the, you know, the two, you know, just if you look at the three institutions uh, that I represented here, excluding Elena, but also if you just include, if they just, let's say the four institutions, there's a lot of, of, of uh, you know, of, of advocacy. There's a lot of attention, media attention. There's a lot of technical, uh, you know, expertise, you know, that can actually be brought in. So. For me, that's really the the major learning point, and we, you know, we, we we did discuss that partnerships. I think I think I think it was it was uh, Michaela that says, you know, for the problems that we need to solve, we can't really do them. Uh, we, we, you can try, but I think to make more impact, we really need to look at how we can. For me, that's really the biggest takeaway that we can really form partnerships that can really uh, make a dent in, in you know in the in in, in, in reducing the protection gap. Thank you. Thanks very much for that. And, and I think those are super pertinent points. 
uh, this kind of open source uh, availability of, of uh, tools and methodologies can be extremely powerful and actually uh, amplify uh, the, the impact in one uh, region with the mirroring activities then in another. And, and if we have the tools, we should certainly aim to make those widely available uh, so that the maximum uh, uh, people can benefit from that. Uh, Malvin, if you allow, um, uh, I've gotten an audience question regarding the parametric insurance uh, used by the African risk capacity. Are you able to explain a little bit more about uh, what this relates to? Yeah, so I'll just uh, quickly go through the drought uh, insurance. Uh, so it's easier for us and much more cost effective for us to issue parametric uh, insurance policies as opposed to the typical indemnity. Because if you're covering a country like Niger, if you look at just the square footage of the country, and you know, if we had to send assessors to look at you know the various regions, it will take a, a long time. And really, our our key value proposition is that we want to be able to provide liquidity to a country soon after the event. So you know, parametric insurance is is, is pretty much planned for that because we don't we you know we. We use a model that uh, requires some input from the country in terms of the reference crop. So, reference crop is basically a crop that you know is is a proxy for food security in the country. And then we we uh, using our model, we're able to define how much uh, rainfall is required at different stages of that crop. So, if uh, you know if there's no rainfall or there's inadequate rainfall at the plant during the planting phase, then we will know that there's a total failure. So we are already able to say there's going to be a drought of X, of X magnitude affecting X number of people. So that you know, so essentially uh, for all our, our covers, we are going to use we we will only use parametric because it's just not cost effective and 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 timely enough for us to use you know you know any other methodology. So we don't need the country to to tell us that there's been a drought. We look at the model, and we are able to estimate the you, you know relying on data that's been. Has been collected, we're able to estimate the actual cost of the drought based on the uh, affordability and other parameters that have been selected by the country. And also uniquely, we're also able to offer the opportunity to uh, humanitarian institutions such as World Food Programme and Star Network, which is a, a conglomerate of UK uh, a, a NGOs. So they're able to purchase insurance coverage over and above that purchased by, by the countries to just help with closing that protection gap. So just a, a very quick uh, overview. And we, so we, we've got drought, tropical cyclone, and we uh, shortly be uh, implementing a flood. Uh, and then unrelated to the climate change, but also quite topical, we're also looking at uh, launching a, an outbreaks and epidemics uh, insurance cover that really limits the spreads you know, in that initial phase that it prevents you know, those outbreaks becoming uh, pandemics. So that's just the, just the full suite of products that we'll be looking at. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks very much uh, for that explanation. Uh, and now I turn to, to Marie. Um, any thoughts uh, from your side on the, you know, uh, notion of transferability of best practices, data availability, and how the space has evolved uh, over the past 10 years? Uh, you know, they called a Paris Agreement a landmark and a game changer. Has that had an impact in, in how the industry uh, is responding to the challenge? Yes, no, thanks a lot. I think what is really great, of course, is to see that uh, all the panelists, I mean, we agree, we want to address the protection gap, maybe with different means, but I think the, the aim is the same. And in the evolution in the last 10 years, I think it's it's incredible. There is a lot of evolution. We see especially in the last years now, a lot of developments. I mean, just to give a, an example, a concrete example, I mean, we look at commercial catastrophe models. When I started a couple of years ago, there was no models that really included climate change. And now there are more and more partnerships also with uh, open source climate data to include them in this commercial model to actually be able to really model this uh, in the insurance portfolio. So I think a lot of development, very dynamic, and uh, I think we really need to to monitor that, of course, uh, very closely. And what is key from today's conversation, 
uh, we need to work together. Uh, the private sector alone will not manage to address the protection gap. Uh, supervisors either alone. I think we really need to work. Public-private partnerships are key. Mikaela mentioned uh, this climate resilience dialogue, I think is an excellent initiative and uh, we are really also at the OPA supporting it 100%. We want to work together with the industry, with public sector to look into that issue, data sharing and learning also from the insurance sector on good uh, underwriting practices, adaptation measures. I think this will be uh, extremely important. One point also mentioned by uh, Malvern, I think is uh, uh, this point on, on public good, uh, looking at uh, understanding the risk, what is the exposure, what is my risk, uh, what and the different natural catastrophes, I think this can be almost seen as a, as a public good and that everybody should have a right to know, you know, without having to needing to pay for it, raising awareness, I think these are key elements. Excellent. Uh, I think there's a lot of uh, consensus and willingness to cooperate uh, among the panelists. And, and I think that's absolutely key as we move ahead with the agenda and, and as the uh, climate risks become increasingly uh, great. Um, I just wanted to, to kind of uh, offer a few concluding remarks. Uh, it's very clear from me, from what we've heard, is that there is willingness and scope to cooperate and that uh, elements and, and platforms such as the resilience dialogue are appreciated. It could be interesting to see how this could be also taken beyond the European context to, to facilitate uh, discussions between insurers globally. Uh, and maybe that's a note to self because part of our uh, adaptation strategy is of course uh, about taking European practices uh, internationally and also learning from our international partners. There is no one simple solution. There's no panacea. Uh, the matter is really multi-layered and of great importance. The more climate change effects intensify, the more losses increase and the climate protection gap increases. It is really crucial to build more resilience. We also need to help the affected people recover more quickly by making our society more resilient. And unfortunately, we don't have the time now, but it would be interesting to reflect how the sector can increase public awareness um, about the risks and also the financial exposure that, uh, that we have and the possibilities within the sector. The European Union strategy on adaptation aims for Europe to become not only climate neutral, but also climate resilient by 2050. This requires smarter, more systemic and faster adaptation. And many of you have referred to the data, to the modeling, to, to you know, using that kind of evidence to anticipate and increase the preparedness, not just on the, the sector, but also among businesses. I think uh, this is also where insurance sector needs to come in and play a role. With its long-standing expertise and know-how, the insurance sector can play a central role in assisting us in building climate resilient communities. Because good climate risk man management can increase risk awareness and promote resilience by incentivizing adaptation measures. And public authorities can and must help everyone to understand what needs we have in our cities and regions and what barriers are preventing a proper insurance penetration. As a takeaway, I would also say that, the, you know, we need international cooperation and, and uh, lots of different stakeholders involved to bring their specific perspectives. This includes public authorities, consumers, representatives, uh, NGOs even, many others, and of course, the financial sector itself. And we hope that uh, throughout our experience with the climate dialogues um, and the resilience dialogue in specific, we will be able to make a significant contribution to the uh, public debate in Europe and internationally. Colleagues, uh, friends, all that remains for me now to do is to extend a really big thank you to all of you for your time to, with us and, and close this event thanking you for your participation and time.
Thank you very much.